from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And here's what's ahead. K-State's Dan O'Brien centers his grain market comments this week on the corn market. He'll reflect on the USDA's latest corn supply and demand numbers, as well as the corn crop prospects in South America, saying that all things considered, corn prices are not likely to rise much higher here in 2019. Then K-State's Robin Reed will talk about developing a cash flow plan for the farm or ranch for this year, saying it's essential for you producers to routinely stay on top of that cash flow as profit margins remain thin. And in later to brief us on the latest on Kansas agricultural weather, K-State's Mary Knapp. All that and more coming your way next on this Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. To start our Friday edition, it's to the grain markets and narrowing it down this week to what's going on in the corn market sector. As our guest has just put together his updated corn market outlook for mid-February, Dan O'Brien is a grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. Dan, the comments that you'll offer today are on the heels of that spate of USDA grain supply and demand reports released all at once last Friday morning. Staying with the corn, what did you see there that resonated with you? Well, the USDA did come out and lower the size of the 2018 corn crop. And that was suspected that it may happen, but it's still a surprise to see it actually happen. Again, dropped it. I think it's 206 million bushels. Now the yield figures that we were talking about all last summer of 180 bushel plus and all of that, now that projection is down to 176.4 bushels per acre. And the trend coming into 2019 is basically that and just a little bit higher, 176.5. So the top end of the yield that we were trading on uh, in, in the markets for a good while now, again, 100. 179, 178, 180 bushel, that's not there. So we've, we've taken that back. So now we have a projection of 14.42 billion bushels instead of 14.6 something. If, if that's all that had happened and there weren't any adjustments made by the USDA in the uh, usage category for this old crop marketing year, if there'd been no changes, then gosh, ending stocks, would have been taken down from, again, about 17.8 down to suddenly 15.8, and we'd see upward price pressure for corn, et cetera. But uh, USDA came in after the production numbers were lowered. They uh, had seen, and justifiably, some slowness in uh, ethanol usage. Again, lack of profitability. We've, you and I have been talking about mm-hmm. that now for several months. Some plants uh, on the fringe deciding to at least temporarily close, uh, rumors of this happening. So you have uh, the USDA dropping their ethanol production uh, usage of corn number from 5.6 to 5.575. And that's only 25 million, but it's still 25 million, and it's not increasing. That's probably the big issue. So still an awful lot of corn being used. But the uh, USDA is backing off their projection of corn use. And they also, again, following on the heels of the quarterly stocks report, I had adjusted lower the livestock feed use number. That's probably the bigger cutback from 5.5 billion down to 5.375. So you kind of shave this and you, and you adjust that. You end up and have that 206 million bushel decline in, in U.S. corn production ending up at the bottom line of about a 46 to 50 million bushel change in ending stock. So you kind of mitigate. And, and ration a bit the uh, the reduction in, in usage. Ending stocks still projected to be about 11.67 percent stocks to use, and you know that's not 10 percent. But gosh, compared to the 
16, 17 mark in the year we, when we were at 15.6, 15.7, and, and last year we were at 14.5. Well, now we're looking at 11.6, and, and if these usage categories don't ultimately fall back as far as the uh, USDA is projected, we're looking closer to 11 or below 11 towards 10 if, if we get strong usage here on out. So I guess we'll see, but overall can't deny that that the corn balance sheet has tightened up a little bit mm-hmm. and should also mention what happened in grain sorghum. Uh, the grain sorghum production number didn't change very much. Again, had projected back in uh, November, December about 399, 400 million bushels, and that, that number was really unchanged. They cut back the acres, raised the yield, ended up in the same place, basically. They did cut back on feed and residual usage. That projection and left unchanged the food seed industry usage number. So uh, some grain sorghum setting off and ethanol plants is at 100 million bushels, probably. Uh, export number left unchanged at 100 million. So it's a combination of cutting back feed residual usage and leaving every, everything else unchanged resulted in stocks climbing by about 25, 26 million bushels. Stocks to use really jumping pretty high up to 19, almost 20 percent. But Again, grain sorghum, as we found out, and, and well, we already knew, but had confirmed in the grain sorghum production meetings that we would had a couple weeks ago. Again, right now, since that crop is competing with corn in this region where we grow it, uh, in particular, for, uh, again, livestock feed use, for ethanol usage, you know, it's uh, slogging it out in the feed grain market on, on a price competitive basis. And and I think you're, you're, the adjustments in the, in the grain sorghum supply demand balance sheet uh, are, are reflecting that. But again, on the corn side, all of these limiting factors that you just listed, if there is a supporting factor in corn, it might be on the export side. Uh, hopefully not grasping at straws here, but there is a, a slight indication of favorable developments there. Yeah, you know, the time when available competitive supplies would be on the market from Brazil uh, in particular, and Argentina is really months away. So we've got a time window here where uh, where it's very likely that one of the only major suppliers in town on on the world market for corn would be would be the u s in fact the Brazilian second crop harvest you know begins in May, runs all the way to August so We've got at least 60, 90 days, and and that's just the beginning of their harvest. And for Argentina, their harvest for corn would begin in March. But again, the the bulk of it's coming off in April and May again. So I think it will be really key here to see what, well, what their crop prospects are down there, of course, but also to see what happens now. And arguably, they're probably running short on exportable feed grain supplies out of South America. If if it's going to happen, it's now. We'll be watching the weekly weekly export shipment numbers, see what's going on. Well, and and really, probably what we'll what we'll really be looking for will be in the next week to ten days when the USDA releases not just the shipments but the forward purchases numbers when they come out. Then we'll get some idea, I think, of of how aggressive buyers have been or, or anticipate that they're wanting or going to be in the feed grain market going forward. And you know that data. That'll have a lot to do with the sentiments, optimism, pessimism of the market going forward. And it'll just be a factor we don't normally pay much attention to that'll be coming onto the market in the next, uh, next 5, 10, 15 days. Well, Dan, you've thrown all of this into the pot, so to say, as you put together your updated U.S. corn supply and demand balance sheet, and that results then in your projections on U.S. corn average farm price in 2019 under various scenarios, higher exports, lower exports, uh, stronger ethanol demand, particularly this summer if E15 kicks in for good. All of that considered, all of those variables in play, the range for corn prices is still quite limited. Yeah, you know, we can do a lot of, a lot of quote, fiddling around the edges. But, again, absent a major crop shortfall either in the southern hemisphere or the makings of one in our part of the world and here to the north, there doesn't seem to be anything out there that would, that would make a half a billion or a billion bushel difference on supplies that would really drive prices one way or the other. So, you know, we're talking about optimism for prices, and that would drive us from 360 to 375, <laughs> you know, or 390. And I'm not belittling that, those changes. Those would be 
greatly appreciated for people storing uh, 2018 crop corn and making plans for 2019. But the big changes will seem to be uh, weather-driven affairs. And, uh, you know, that type of risk and uncertainty starts in earnest in May, June, and July. So when you put that out there, it makes one wonder about where corn will fare in the battle for acres this spring vis-a-vis soybeans. Well, we will have to see, uh, again, these trade negotiations with mm-hmm. uh, between the U.S. and China. If China follows through on what they had promised they would do, they have stated they're going to buy a whole bunch of, of U.S. ag products. And I think the market's taking the view, as we probably all should, that that we're all from Missouri and we want to actually see it before we count on it. Mm-hmm. But that could come into play. But if there's an agreement there... It could bring optimism into the soybean market. And November soybeans, uh, as we look at it, 9, 60 or so, gosh, if we have a trade agreement and we uh, see a jump in purchases, where does that go? Is that 10, 10 to 10, 50 something? So if that happens, then we're looking at corn versus soybean price ratios and trying to figure out what to do. And add in, I think as you and I have mentioned, a lot of wet weather in the states to the east, north, and far east of here. We're at the place now with all the snow we've had and moisture back there. I don't think we're helped by just normal weather. I think we need dry weather, <laughs> really, to try to get into those fields in a timely manner. So, and in those areas, that's a rarity for springtime. Yeah. So I, I would anticipate that's probably the next next thing here in the U.S. that's on our uh, on our radar is just you know how, how soon can we get crops planted? And if we're delayed enough in some of these areas, do those acres get pushed out the end of the the back end of the planting window for corn off into soybeans again. Well, this has been a mere outline of Dan's full write-up on the corn market outlook here in mid-February, as posted on the agmanager.info website if you'd like to have a full view of his numbers and commentary. agmanager.info. As always, Dan, we appreciate the remarks. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Take care. That from grain market economist Dan O'Brien, K-State Research and Extension, along with us from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas. We'll be back shortly on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Welcome back. And now to follow up on a particular point that was brought up in our conversation just a few days back with the executive director of the Kansas Farm Management Association at K-State, Kevin Herbel. One of the things that he played up as he went over management tactics and uh, strategies was the importance of a cash flow as part of your management plan. And so we'll expand on that right here for our guest actually addressed this topic at the recent Women Managing the Farm Conference here in Manhattan. Agricultural economist Robin Reed of K-State Research and Extension. So Robin, just to set the table, what is a cash flow in the context of farm and ranch management? Well, this is a statement that simply looks at cash in and cash coming out of the business. Um, A lot of times we get a little confused between this and the income statement. The income statement is what's evaluating the profitability of your operation. So the expenses that incurred to produce the income that was made get lined up. That's what we kind of call an accrual adjustment. Also, depreciation, non-cash expenses are captured in an income statement so that we get a true picture of profitability in the operation. What we call with cash flow, what it does is evaluate feasibility. So will my operation cash flow? Will I have sufficient income on the cash side to pay the outflows or the cash that's required to operate my business for this given year? And that complements the other tools that we talk of, the other elements of management. Yes. So it's very important when you're looking at any financial statement that you're looking at the other important statements as well to really get a whole picture of your business. So most all producers are familiar with a balance statement or a picture of their net worth at any given time. I would argue doing that statement, 
looking at your income statement, looking at cash flow for the next year or historical cash flow to develop that projection, and even enterprise budgets, as I know Kevin touched on last time. So looking at all these different pieces of your finances really helps, especially in the downturn in the farm economy we have now, just to prepare yourself for the coming year and you know have those red flags show up if they need to as we go throughout the year. And that's where the cash flow comes in, if in fact there are those red flags out there that need to be addressed? Yes. So there's a a number of different ways to put together a cash flow. But the bottom line is you want to outline, and I'll touch in a minute how to actually put this together, but the purpose is to outline where you see cash coming in and out of your business throughout the year, and I'm specifically talking about a monthly cash flow, and then you can monitor that throughout the year. So if you have projected your 2019 cash flow and you get into February, we'll say, and you have a $20,000 repair on a tractor, you know, some other unexpected large expense that might throw a whole monkey rich in your entire year, you know, that is what I'm talking about with red flags, so where you can plan how you're going to address when those might happen by having that outlined throughout the entire year. Well, then how does one, to put it this way, construct a cash flow mechanism that works for them to meet the objectives of tracking where you are? Sure. So this is a little hard to do over the radio. Right. <laughs> you know, what I like to do is put an example in front of people and that's how you can really understand how this works because it's a fairly simple statement. You know, you're looking at, like I said, actual dollars coming in and out of the business. So your inflows, obviously the sales of the production that you're making on your farm, the agricultural program payments or crop insurance proceeds that might be coming in, capital asset sales, if you sold some equipment, possibly land or other things, you know, in the coming year, you can outline when those might occur and when that money might come in. Loan proceeds, if you're doing an investment and you're needing to take out a loan, putting that in there to show, you know, when the money would come out and go in from the loan. And then off-farm income, something we don't always think about in a cash flow, but what I try to tell people is if your off-farm income and family living will affect the farm's cash flow, then it is important to put these two things together. You can certainly take that out and just look at how the farm's going to cash flow, but end of the day, if you're a sole proprietorship and that taking money out of the business for family living is going to occur, then this is something we want to see on the cash flow and likely your lender is going to require you to do that as well. So so for some outflow items, obviously your input, seed, fertilizer, chemical, anything like that, capital asset purchases, if you're going to plan for a new piece of equipment this year or trading in, anything like that, you can outline when that expense will occur and make sure you have the cash flow to do it. Family living, taxes, loan payments, anything like that where money is coming out of the business in the form of cash. Now, the difference between your total inflow and your total outflow is what we call the net cash flow. And this is the bottom line number that we are trying to get to. And when you identify that net cash flow, is there a standard by which a producer would know that they're in good stead or would start to send up those signals that something is of concern? Good question. This goes back to cash flow is not necessarily a measure of profitability. So in the case farm that I work with with farmers, they actually have a negative cash flow throughout the entire year period. Now, does that mean they're not profitable? Well, in my case farm, they actually bought a $100,000 piece of equipment and financed 80000 of it. So they used $20,000 cash to make that investment. So even though at you know, the annual total was in the red or a negative cash flow because of making that investment. You know, they really were not on profitable. And the flip-flop can occur. You can easily have a positive cash flow but not be profitable. And just an example of that, if you held over a lot of grain from last year, sold it in 2019 this coming year, and maybe sold a lot of your 2019 production in this coming year. So essentially you had a lot more sales than you had expenses to produce that grain. So you could easily cash flow in that situation, but not really be profitable. So that is a very sharp distinction. And because several of those building blocks, if you will, for cash flow 
can change over time, although you're on a monthly schedule here. Does one need to flex along the way in a given, say, calendar year with their cash flow plan? Well, the important thing is to just look at when you do this projection for 2019, we'll say, what does each month look like and how does that affect your cash balance on hand or the operating loan that you're going to need to tap into? So again, I'll just kind of mention the case farm we work with. They started out with a positive cash balance at the beginning of the year. I know some of our farms out there are not in this financial situation. We've had a lot of years of losses, and we might be starting the year with an operating loan balance already. In this example, we did have small positive cash on hand. But, you know, a lot of our inputs go in in the spring, and we don't harvest till October. So they dipped really heavily into their operating loan by September. Now, what I pose the question is, well, what do you do if you're proposing an operating loan balance that's higher than what your banker is willing to do? So in this example, we were over $300,000. Now, what do we do if $300,000 is our operating loan limit? And so a lot of small things typically can contribute to how you address a cash shortfall first step is just knowing that that might occur and being able to ahead of time prepare for what you can do in that situation, knowing how much that shortage might be. And then what we're seeing is a lot of little things that can help that. It's usually not one big thing that you can change to address a cash shortfall. Such as? Well, family living I touched on. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of scaling up of family living when times were good and pulling that back down is difficult in many situations. But there are items in family living that could be addressed or the timing of when we make family living purchases could be changed if we know our operating loan might max out in a given month. Off-farm income, we've talked about that on, on other sessions. It's not the best solution in a lot of cases or it's already occurring. But bringing some money in to supplement family living when our times are hard in agriculture is something to look at. The timing of expenses, obviously, you know, like I said, September is a big month for a shortfall. So are there expenses that we can hold off and pay after that? Where I said we're making an investment in our case farm business. Well, maybe that investment shouldn't occur in July. Maybe we can make that investment in October. And then, like I said, getting creative. If there's unused or underutilized assets on your farm, if you can walk around your operation and pick some pieces of equipment or things that just aren't being used or be more profitable to hire done, you know, things like that. Where can I scrape up some cash for my operation? By the way, Robin, you point out that there are helpful tools for one who wants to get rolling on their cash flow management online at the agmanager.info website, correct? So yes, I made reference to if you just see a picture of a cash flow, it's pretty easy to put one together knowing that framework. So we have two tools in Ag Manager. One is KSU Integrated Financial Statements that has the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow. And we also have a spreadsheet called Monthly Cash Flow for Operating Loan Determination. And any producer can download those spreadsheets put in their own titles and numbers of what inflows and outfills they have, and automatically calculate what their cash balance and operating loan projection might be. Those are very helpful for this cause. And Robin, we appreciate you passing this along to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Agricultural economist Robin Reed, K-State Research and Extension, and she talked up conducting a cash flow analysis of your operation at the recent Women Managing the Farm Conference And you're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll have more on the K-State Radio Network. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. As next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, the USDA sees net cash income for agriculture remaining relatively flat over the next decade as expenses steadily rise while income for crops and livestock fail to keep pace, according to the department. Yesterday, the USDA's Office of the Chief Economist released a spreadsheet of long-term projections for farm receipts, expenses, and income. The office also released long-term projections for trade as well. After a decline last year, the USDA now has cash receipts for crops rising this year by $2.2 billion up to $200 billion, rising further next year to $203 billion. The USDA is bullish on crop sales through 2028, showing a steady rise in overall receipts through that time frame to $226 billion by the year 2028. Now, for livestock, the USDA is relatively flat in uh, the returns going forward. It projects livestock cash receipts dipping a bit this year to $176 billion. Over the next couple of years, the USDA projects livestock cash receipts will continue to decline to $173 billion in 2022 before gradually rising to $178 billion 10 years from now. Overall, the USDA sees cash receipts in agriculture, including crops, livestock, government payments, other farm-related income at $420 billion this year, but continuing to rise over the next decade to $455 billion by 2028. Farm expenses, though, will grow at a faster pace than income over this next decade. Expenses are projected by the USDA at $322 billion this year. Those will continue to steadily tick upward to $361 billion by 2028. The result, then, is that net cash income projected at nearly $98 billion this year, will fall next year by $5 billion and will remain under $97 billion each year through 2028. Net cash income for agriculture was $104 billion in 2017, but the USDA does not see scenarios playing out over the next decade that we return to that larger net cash income. Well, you spring crop producers can now select the multi-county enterprise unit as part of your crop insurance coverage for acreage in two counties within the same state. We have more on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. Among the crop insurance offerings with an upcoming producer sign-up deadline, February 28th or March 15th, depending on location, is a recently introduced endorsement. USDA Risk Management Agency Administrator Martin Barbary says about the multi-county enterprise unit. It's something that producers have been asking for for a few years. This endorsement, available through local crop insurance agents, gives growers the option of covering two counties in the same state under their crop insurance policy especially when acreage in one county consists of smaller parcels. It allows a producer that uses the enterprise unit discount system, he's using it in one county, maybe he has some adjoining acreage in another county, but that acreage doesn't qualify on its own for an enterprise unit. He now has the option of bringing those acres into his other county's enterprise unit, and everything will fit under one enterprise unit. With the idea behind the multi-county enterprise unit being not only coverage flexibility, but a low-cost coverage option for producers. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the 60-day public comment period for the newly proposed Waters of the United States rule was launched yesterday with the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers publishing the rule in the Federal Register. This new rule moves forward while the 2015 rule remains in legal limbo and essentially in effect in 22 states. The EPA and the Corps are on track to finalize the new rule by September, which is likely to trigger a new round of legal challenges. The public comment period closes on April the 15th. A longtime wheat industry supporter recently ramped up its commitment to improving wheat production by way of a research grant. It will fund efforts to enhance wheat yields and quality through new approaches to wheat nutrient management. Marsha Boswell has more on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? Graincraft, the largest independent flour miller in the nation, has provided a significant donation to the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation in support of impactful wheat research. The gift will be directed toward ongoing research to improve wheat quality and yield through proper fertility management. The research is being conducted by a team of scientists from Kansas State University and USDA ARS in Manhattan, Kansas. The main goal of the research is to provide management guidelines to Kansas wheat farmers to maximize yield and quality 
through the proper application of nitrogen and sulfur on wheat. Early results indicate that proper sulfur management can improve key baking characteristics of bread wheat and could decrease acrylamide formation in baked goods. According to Aaron Harries, VP of Research and Operations for the Kansas Wheat Commission, the team conducting this research includes some of the brightest scientists in the wheat research community. Depending on the discoveries made, this project has the potential to revolutionize the way farmers grow wheat for added value. Ron Supis, chair of the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation, says we greatly appreciate GrainCraft's support of this important research. GrainCraft has been a leader in engaging in dialogue with wheat farmers and breeders concerning the importance of wheat quality. They have set a good example for the entire supply chain by recognizing the need to invest upstream in research to improve the product they purchase. Alan Koenig, Chief Supply Chain Officer for GrainCraft, says the research that the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation is doing aligns perfectly with GrainCraft's ongoing pursuit of high-quality wheat. He says we have a shared focus on flower quality with our customers, along with the well-being of the U.S. wheat farmer. These two go hand-in-hand, hand, and this project will enable farmers to have higher yield while also bringing a high-quality product to the market. GrainCraft has a long-standing relationship with the Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas State University. The company has supported each with collaborative partnerships, special funding, and data analysis assistance throughout the years. In addition, GrainCraft participates in the internship program, which is fielded through the KSU Grain Science Department. The Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation was established in 2011 as the official research fundraising organization for the Kansas Wheat Commission. While the wheat checkoff does fund wheat research, it is also used for marketing promotion and education. Tax-deductible gifts made to the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation are used solely for the purpose of funding wheat research. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. Well, we won't be done with winter for a while. According to K-State's Mary Knapp, she'll tell us more about it next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reached thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Next up on Agriculture Today, our weekly stint on Kansas agricultural weather with Mary Knapp, Mike Side once more, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension as we remain in winter's rather firm grip, Mary. But looking back at this last week, on the temperature side, there was another up and down run, if you will. Right, and it depends very much on where you were in the state. In western Kansas, they actually saw some spring-like temperatures uh, yesterday, in fact, they were reaching 70 degrees with sunshine. In the eastern part of the state, where the clouds dominated a little bit more, we were struggling to get up into the mid-50s. Of course, that was swiftly moved out by the north winds that came in and brought some very cold temperatures in. Uh, we're starting the day out in the teens, and it's not likely to get much warmer. The other side of that winter weather is that we are getting precipitation. We're getting some fairly significant snowfall in the eastern parts of the state right now. It's kind of interesting to note that because those upper air temperatures are cold, these snowflakes are very, very fine, but they are still coming at a very prolific rate. They are very slippery, so anybody that's out there traveling now should pay attention to that. The heaviest snowfall is going to be, again, right about midday and continue into the evening hours, so there will be problems with the evening commute if you're um, going to any evening activities. Give yourself some extra time to get to them because it's going to be a little bit nasty. 
But again, we're talking the eastern part of the state, basically from Hayes eastward. There are a few isolated flurries in the western regions of the state, but they're not getting nearly the event that the eastern part is. And what they're talking of in terms of likely totals up to maybe a half a foot in some areas. Yeah, the latest I've seen has been um, somewhere between three and seven inches. There may be a few places that get even more than that. Again, it's going to be interesting to see just how productive this particular storm is. It's also worth noting that this isn't the last one in the train. There are a number of systems that are coming ashore on the West Coast, and they have to move eastward. The question is, are they going to our north or our south, or are we going to get the benefit as far as the moisture goes? The western half of the state really could use a shot of some of that moisture that they've not seen as much. We're not seeing any drought conditions develop yet, mainly due to the fact that we've been much colder than normal for the last couple of weeks. Any way you slice it, though, as we project forward into the spring, we're going to go into the planting season into moisture virtually throughout the state, it would seem. Right. Even in the West, where they've missed out on that They may be dry at the 2-inch level, but when you get down there, the 8 and the 20-inch level still showing ample moisture in there. So the soil profile still has moisture in there from our fall and late summer last year. And in the West, they did see quite a bit of moisture in December and January. So it's not by any means the situation that we were facing last year at this time where (laughs) there wasn't anything anywhere as far as moisture goes. So, no, that's going to complicate spring activities, especially if we continue to have normal moisture, which is what they are forecasting. By the same token, for our cow-calf producers out there, calving right now (laughs) is not a nightmare, but it certainly is more challenging in these conditions. Personally, I would call it a nightmare because there is a a very sloppy ground um, and these storms are not very favorable for the livestock operations, particularly when it comes in the form of the freezing rain that we've seen in a number of events that compromises the winter coats of the cows and calves and is a lot more dangerous for the survival of those animals than say, a nice light snow with temperatures in the upper 20s, lower 30s. Um, So, yeah, it it has been a challenging season and also a challenging season for anybody that has uh, confined operations. If they've got some feeders out there, the feedlots are either a muck or they're a frozen mess, and that isn't helping matters much either. And also, the colder temperatures are increasing the feed demand, so that makes it, again, a more challenging operation than what we may have seen in the past couple of years. Well, Mary, for those longing for change in something resembling more spring-like conditions, the wait will have to continue through the balance of February, you say. Right, and we should also note they finally pronounced that there is an El Nino They made that announcement yesterday. Uh, The upper air winds have finally come in unison with the warmer than normal temperatures. It's a very weak El Nino, and much of what's driving our current conditions can't be really attributed to the El Nino. It's more the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is in an active phase, producing more frequent storms that are influencing the continental U.S., So what that means for Kansas and the Central Plains is a wetter-than-normal spring? What? Uh, Typically, when we have an El Nino event, uh, we are favored with wetter-than-normal conditions, and that can continue into the summer. We'll have to see how long this El Nino lasts and just how strong it manages to maintain. At this point, it's not As again, as I said, it's not particularly strong, so the influence will be less. But again, that's just another thumb on the scale for normal to wetter than normal conditions rather than a La Nina, which is beginning to raise its head in the long-range projections. And that typically favors hotter and drier conditions and have a particularly strong signal for that in our late summer and into our fall. 
But to sum up for next week, there's another round or two of storms waiting in the wings. So the chances for more snow, more freezing rain conditions, colder weather, they're all right there. Right. And it, it would behoove us to check for the latest updates because, again, uh, the tracks are uncertain in that. And it doesn't take much of a shift in the track to either give you a dump of snow or leave you without anything at all. Stay on top of those conditions, and particularly when traveling about. Mary, thanks. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Eric. She's along with us each Friday to bring us the latest on Kansas agricultural weather. Climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension, and bidding you a good weekend as well. As always, our thanks to you for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.